is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Mark E. Mosier, DDS, FAGD. He possesses over 30 years of experience in dental management as a coach, leader, lecturer, and author of countless management articles. Success seems to follow him down every avenue. His skills include strategic planning, organic growth, employee relations, conflict resolutions, communications, marketing, and efficiency with an emphasis in dental group practice. Simply put, he places a strong focus on improving the quality of life for his clients by simplifying business systems and increasing productivity, all without sacrificing quality. As a third-generation dentist whose grandfather co-founded the American Academy of Dental Practice Administrators, his DNA is strung together with the principles of practice administration and management. Following in the footstep of his role models, he received his bachelor's a dental degree from the greatest dental school that ever existed, the University of Missouri, Kansas City, where he graduated uh, two years before me in 85, and I graduated in 87. After building his first highly successful dental practice, Dr. Moser was invited to step into the full-time management arena. Since... He has been utilizing his love for teaching in two dental group, in two dental schools and developing group dental practices for dentists, owners, and private equity. Once he discovered his passion for consulting with groups, having grown a de novo group into a success, group practice development became his prime focus. In addition to receiving honors for his achievement, Dr. Moser has been appointed and elected to several national leadership positions. Currently, he's an active member of the board of directors for the American Academy of Dental Group Practice, among other prestigious positions in the industry. In his free time, you can find Dr. Mosier flying airplanes, attacking the hills of Texas on his mountain bike, or with his family at church. He and his wife, Darcy, have three children, a son in high school, a daughter in college, and their oldest son and his wife have been blessed them with two grandchildren. It is just a huge honor. You were a legend back in dental school. Like, I was just one of those Humpty Dumpty students. You were like, what were you, like class president, or you're, you're in charge of something? What well, you have good memory because I used to stand up in front of your class and make announcements. I was on the on the board of trustees for the Student Dental Association, which meant I got to travel a lot and I had to pay for it. So we had a lot of fun. It was a lot, lot, lot of a lot of great times, and um, mainly working with the ADA as a student. Yeah, that is amazing. And I'm sorry to hear that um, your third generation dentist, the second right. generation, your father uh, passed away this year. I'm very sorry to hear about that. Well, you know, he lived life full. My grandfather practiced until he was 85 years old. My father practiced full time, never even slacked off at all, five days a week until he was 86. And he passed away age 90, still an active pilot. He restored a couple of airplanes. He was still members of a study club. I couldn't teach him anything ever. He was always up on everything, just like his dad. So um, kept me on my toes, but... And what, what, where, what city did he practice in? He was in Kansas. Uh, they, they both practiced in a small town in Kansas called Harrington, which is interesting. My grandfather settled there in 1922, also UMKC. It was called Western Dental College. My grandfather, my father graduated there in 54, where it was called Kansas City School of Dentistry. And then, of course, it, it changed the name in the late 60s to UMKC. Same school. But my grandfather was out there. Uh, he developed a five-chair dental office in 1932. Now, in the 1930s, dentists had one chair. Maybe they cut hair at the same time, too. I don't know. It was a long time ago. But to have five chairs, you know, back in the 30s was really unusual. And that's when he and his best friend, who was uh, Harry Clinton, he was president of the American Dental Association, they started lecturing and practice management. It was their passion. And uh, he boasted to have the largest uh, dental office west of Mississippi. But a lot of study clubs come through. My dad told stories of Greyhound buses that come in, and he did a lot of uh, in services there at the office. But uh, they're very entrepreneurial. They invented a lot of widgets, a lot of things. You know, some things that come and gone. Some things still used today, like the chrome steel crown. You know, that's that's the one thing that I know is still around. You know, electrosurgery and and dentistry. Pins, post. I, I remember. You, you don't remember we had to bring extracted teeth to school. I got some of my grandfather, and they had like paper clips and screws in them from things he was doing back in the '30s and '40s. But so, yeah, getting and your dad the, served with General MacArthur. He did. 
Yeah, boy, you, you did your homework. He served in the occupation with General MacArthur. It's interesting, General Headquarters is what those, or Central Headquarters. My father was in charge of the 11 judges for the Tribunal of the Far East. That's the Japanese war trials. Each country had a, had a, a judge to represent it. There was 11 countries. And so he was in charge of those judges. He took care of them, got whatever they needed. He lived in the courthouse, which is the war minister building. So a lot of stories. He got to hear two and a half years of trial testimony and mailed home a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. You know, but, the most interesting thing is, um, you know, um, becoming a lecturer and get to lecturing all, all those countries, you know, lecturing 50 countries. I was so ignorant of history. I'll never forget this. First time I lectured in San Paulo. You're driving down, you know, it's the largest city in South America, and you're driving down somehow, and all of a sudden you think you're in Tokyo. And then you drive a little farther, and then you think you're in Berlin. And I'm like, whoa, 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 what happened? They go, oh, my God, everybody knew the the biggest, richest industrial people in Germany and Japan knew this was not going to end well. So they all fled the country, and they moved down there. And that's why right after World War II, uh, Brazil started making cars and airplanes and and all this Correct. It is amazing down there. Uh, just, just crazy, crazy history. Well, I want to. I don't know what you want to. I mean, you could talk about anything from clinical to. I mean, you could talk about anything from A to Z. But one of the reasons um, I want to bring you on so bad is uh, all the dentists our age think the sky is falling because of corporate dentistry, and right. you're a high quality dentist who I would let you work on me or my children or grandchildren any day of the week. What, what are your thoughts about this corporate dentistry? Because when you and I came out of UGC, we already saw the first round of this rodeo with um, Orthodontic Centers of America. There was a dozen oh, trade gosh. on NASDAQ. And so, so we, we've been watching these guys for 30 years. Uh, talk, what, what are your thoughts on corporate dentistry? Is it the end of the world or the beginning of Boy, a new world? When I was president of the Alumni Association, Orthodontic Sim- Centers of America were trying to pay us $9 million at the dental school to get their foot in the door. That was controversial. But, you know, it's, it's like anything else. You know, um, Kmart's a franchise. Nordstrom's a franchise. You know, a fran- I mean, I have a friend of mine who's an orthodontist, and he has two locations. I said, well, you're a DSO. You know, you have more than one location. And they're good and bad and different. Ten years ago, I would not have encouraged my daughter to go into dentistry because – you know, as you know, you have to wear a lot of hats. And but today, with the high quality groups that are available, you you can actually go to work Monday to Thursday, leave work at work, and focus on dentistry if that's what you choose. So there are good and bad groups. Unfortunately, early on, there are a lot of groups that weren't so great. They were focusing on uh, a lot of emergency dentistry and low end dentistry, and they get these dentists out of school. You know, it's like one and done, like NCAA. They get them for one year, and then they move on. And uh, some of those still exist. And those are the ones that make the, the media, particularly in Texas here three or four years ago, those pedo groups. But that's so, not so much the case today. To retain a dentist, you better have your act together. And it's getting really competitive with the shortage of dentists. So some of these groups are really raising the bar up. You know, eight years ago, 5% of all dentists were in some kind of group. Today, it's 32%. And there's all kinds of names for them. Corporate, otherwise, you know, the ADA tried to put things in the box, and they call things differently. But really, the overall catchphrase is DSO. I represent the groups for the American Dental Association. Every year we meet and have a strategic planning meeting. We call the National Dental Roundtable. We bring the, the heads of all the specialties. And eight years ago, the ADA and the AGD really didn't think that groups were so, such a good deal, and they're quickly getting left behind. Today, it's a complete change of attitude. I mean, complete. There are a couple of things I wish, I probably wish they could take back that they said, but it is the future. It happened in medicine, hospitals, pharmacy, and it's quickly happened in dentistry. So to... to Finish what I started with. There are some very high quality groups out there that I'm very proud of to uh, to know and, and represent. And there are some that aren't so great, but they're getting to be a, the, the ones that aren't so great are getting to be a very a much smaller percentage. So drop some names. Who, who do you think the top three high quality ones are? Oh gosh, I, that's as in danger of leaving some out. You know, I mean, here's a small group, Kids Care, and that's spelled with a, with a K. They're out in uh, S- Sacramento. High quality pedo, Heartland, led by Pat Bauer. I mean, 
that, I mean, what a great leader. He has a tremendous team. That company has always been pretty good. They're really doing great. Their, their dental director, Dr. New, is just doing some great things. And they Who's got their dental director? Uh, I believe it's Dr. New from St. Louis. Uh, he has specialty d- dental directors, like five or six under him. They, they specialize in different areas. One's in Invisalign, one's in, in cosmetics, one's in perio. And the, the key to what Heartland has done is clear. They, they all say they're doctor-centered. They all do. But really get behind the, the doctor. You know, one of my clients is called Family First Dental. It's a small group, about 36 offices. They're, they're all in Iowa and Nebraska. And it's largely owned by a, a really good dentist. And, you know, they look at profits last. First thing they look at is supporting the dentist, supporting the team. You know, their name reflects what they're about. They go into rural towns and I'm very proud of their strategic plan, how they do things. It's all about the dentist. And, you know, when I look at a group, one of the first things I look at is doctor retention, doctor turnover. It's just like looking at an individual practice. When I grew my own group, which is a high-quality group called Apple White Dental, I'm not involved with that anymore. But when we're looking at acquiring a practice, we look at the staff turnover. And you see, you know, assistants, hygienists being there for a year or two, that says a lot about the dentist. You hear this 15, 20, 25 years. That says a lot about the dentist. Same thing in groups. When you have this lengthy retention of doctors, you know they're doing something right. And that's always proportional. So that was uh, that was uh, very interesting. So where where do you think it's going to go? When when did you say it was five percent? You said now in twenty eighteen it's thirty two percent. When was it five percent? Eight years ago. So twenty ten. So yeah. then let's go eight more years out. That would be, oh. let's see, eight and eight would be 16, 26. Where, what do you think it's going to be 20, 20, eight more years? Eight more years? I bet it's going to be every bit of 60, 65%. You think, so right now, so it went from zero to a third to two thirds. So eight years ago, it just started 5%. Eight years later today, it's a third. And you think in uh, eight more years, it'll be two thirds. I do. I do. I mean, there's several things driving that. First of all, we have um, increased females. This is not a sexist statement. This is a factual statement. We have a dramatic increased percentage in females. I mean, the average is 52%. I don't know what it's going to be next year. I was talking to um, somebody going into University of Texas, San Antonio. They said it's going to be 65%. Oh, I was talking to their, their education director, 65% female in the class next year. So you have increased number of females, and a lot of these females, they're career-driven, and they work a few years, and they have, they have a child. And perhaps they don't want to work five days a week. They don't work three days a week. Or, more so to prove my point, they don't want to own because they have other focuses. And I applaud that. They want to be a mom and do other things. I applaud that. But they just don't have the time or the desire to be the accountant, be the HR, do all the things you have to do, wear all these hats you have to do if you own your own practice. So the increased percentage of females in the industry is pushing uh, toward DSOs. The other one is the cost of education is skyrocketing. You know, two years ago, the average, this is average, was $257,000 at four years. Now, the University of Texas San Antonio is about 200,000. Harvard is 450, 500. It's all over the board, but it's high and it's getting higher. So you graduate debt, you have a problem. Before 2008 and 9, Matsco Financing would give you money if you had a doctor in front of your name. Today, that's not true. You know, uh, Matsco Financing, I believe now, is Wells Fargo Healthcare. And they, just because you have a doctor in front of your name does not get you that $600,000 to set up a three-chair office with lease space. It just doesn't do it. So, you know, that debt that they want to retire, that cost has a big impact in the growth of DSOs. And there are some other things going on. The DSOs that are involved in um, government programs are getting more difficult to administrate. Uh, there's a lot of focus now. We met with the director of Medicare. There's a lot of focus in uh, preventative, and there's a lot to understand, and the DSOs have specialists in these areas to help the dentist understand risk right down the line. There's a lot of areas that you have to understand, and the DSOs help the doctors do that. Technology, 
gosh, I mean, I can go on and on. You know, every every single dentist that I know who have gotten into a high quality group really like it. You know, I, I think about these docs that are 55, 60 years old, they're getting a little midlife crisis, they've driven their own ship, and they join my group. And my minimum contract is three years. And they're like, okay, fine. I'll tough it out for three years, then I'm gone. Well, what happens is you breathe a little life into them. Now they're, everybody wants to be part of something. As you know, everybody wants to be part of Dental Town. Now they're a part of something. They're in their own culture, their own cult, and they like it. Some of the stress is taken off. You know, Lee Iacocca built Save Chrysler by building on strengths. You go in, you focus on these experienced dentist strengths, and you support those. You offload their weaknesses, and they like it, and they do well. 100% of the dentists in these acquired practices, doctors that came with the practice, were doing better a year later with the group than without. Now, you can define better. They made more money than they did before. Personal income went up. They are happier, the quality of life, their flexibility. So that they just like it. Uh, going back, when you're talking about the females, um, you know, you, you talked about how they might want to work less hours because they want to have a kid. I think the biggest, that that's, a major factor with women, no doubt about it. But I think the other factor that's just as huge, female dentists are always married to a man with a great job. Whereas most male dentists have a stay at home wife and she says she's gonna have some kids, but the, the kids are graduated from college, she's still staying at home with a very high standard of living. So when you're a woman dentist and your husband makes ten thousand dollars a month, you don't have to you don't have to drill fill and bill forty hours a week. But if you're but if you're supporting someone who's staying home, destroying ten thousand dollars a month in capital, you you do. So I mean, th you know, that, that's a huge factor. Um, and it's funny you said it's almost like a cult. The word cult actually comes from the word culture. Did you know that? I did know. That. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's amazing. So what what do you? It, but if there was some, um, if there was some dentist who said to you, um, you know, I've been doing this 10, 20, 30 years. What 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 is the DSOs learn that they could apply to a solo practice? What what do you, what what low hanging fruit lessons do you think uh, that um, solo practitioners could learn from DSOs? Because I always tell these kids when they when they go work in a place like they'll go work in a Harlan, and I say, well, just make sure you realize one thing: most dentists can't manage their own office. You're working for Rick Workman and his CEO Pat Bauer, and they're managing eight hundred offices. So most dentists can't manage their own. These guys are managing 800. Please learn the management lessons. I mean, I mean, how many, and, and, and also what is the sweet spot of bankruptcy on a DSO? Um, you know, when they got one big successful office, they say, well, I'm gonna open up another one. Well, the first one can cash flow a losing second one. And then they would expand to three. It's expanding from two to three most bankruptcies I see are in that $3 million range because when it was your own office, that problem was a little Doberman Pinscher. By the time well, you get to three offices, it's a T-Rex. Well, you asked about three questions there. Try to keep them straight. First one, what could uh, general practice learn from DSO? Well, you know, I, I mentioned a couple of times, it's impossible to do everything really, really well, where the DSOs have specialists in the different areas. So maybe the private office looks at hiring, if he's not going to sell or join, maybe hiring a PEO, you know, somebody to help them or consolidate some of their business systems. Hire a what? A PEO? A PEO. That, that's a professional what's the employment agreement. It's, it's, it's where you have, um, you're not a member of DSO, but some of your business systems are consolidated. And from that, maybe you get some group negotiating power with your insurances or group buying power with your, uh, your dental supplies and even your dental labs. Like, so, you know, that's another – it's really not a DSO, and you still retain your ownership of your practice. But that's, that's a trend that's taken off right now. And, you know, that could work for some dentist. You know, um, what are some major PEOs that you recommend? Oh, gosh. I don't want to go down that road. <laughs> there are okay. some things out now that some friends of mine are, are starting. I don't want to show favoritism, but uh, email me email uh, me a couple of names after the show. Okay, 
none of them are really well established. Some of these guys you'll be familiar with. Yeah, I never even heard of the concept PE. Yeah. Well, it's 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 fairly new and it's taking off. And if I wanted to maintain my own office, my own ownership, that's one thing I do. Another thing I would consider doing would be um, maintaining majority owner and s selling a portion of it so I can have all the benefits of a DSO. You know, there are so many different templates for DSO. I mean, I about the time I think I've heard all, I, I hear new one. I think, well, that's a great idea. I mean, there there is one company that they they sought out fifteen high end offices, known dentists. Really, I mean, it'd be like it'd be like you. And these these are these are doctors that you really don't have anything to fix in their practice. But it was a I'll do it if you do it. You know, it's all or none. And all fifteen of them joined at the same time, and they sold seventy percent of their practice. So I'll just use easy figures because I'm not great at math. So let's say the practice is worth a million dollars. So they buy 70% and they give you $700,000 and now all 15 join. Well, the value of uh, rolling up, you know, you, you get increased multiples and those multiples go up with increased EBITDAs. So, and they're up a lot higher today than they were yesterday. So a low multiple would be five. So let's say because they're all together, now it's worth five and, and they sell it all two years later. So that 30% that they retained, that would be Three hundred thousand dollars originally, but now it's worth five times that. So one point five million. So they got one point five plus the seven, two point two, for a practice that was only worth one million. So that's the value of rolling up. Now those actual a multiple of five is low. It depends on the total EBITDA. They do go up quite a bit. Higher the EBITDA, higher the history. The longer the history, solid the business plan. There are many factors that will affect the uh, the multiples of DSOs. But that's why it's a hot area. I mean, there's a lot of private equity involved in it. seems like half of my consulting anymore is with private equity and valuations. You know, they but, what is, but what is the private equity? Because, you know, like say you and I, when we got out of school, uh, Lazarus of Orthodox Centers of America was able to go public on the New York Stock Exchange. Never right. been done again. A dozen were on NASDAQ. Wall Street wouldn't touch any of these people. When I see um, these venture, venture capital money come in, uh, the people that are in the $5 million range want to grow it for five or 10 years and flip it to someone in the $25 million range. And then those guys want to buy it and flip it. It's, right. it's a hot potato. The exit strategy is only someone, you know, I'm a minnow. I was eaten by a fish. Now I'm eaten by a shark and now I'm waiting on a whale. How come they can't do what all the other businesses do which is just do an IPO. Well, because it's a known, it's it's they're, they're going with knowns. That's the best way I can I can say it. They know that. Well, the, the space is so hot. You know, I already already talked about the demand for manpower and why that's there. And if thirty two percent are in a group, that means sixty eight's not in a group. And the trend continues to go up. The main reason the trend is going up because money's cheap. Interest rates are low. There's a lot of money sidelined. So you have 3,000 private equity groups, and a third of those want to be in dental because they know it's hot. And only 10% of that third know about dental, understand dental. You know, this, so you got 1,000 private equity groups who want to be in dental, and only, you know, only 100 of them understand dental. The rest of them want to be in it. You know, so there's a lot of there's a lot of private equity buying groups, and they, they sit there treading water trying to figure it out. But so, you know, it's like anything else. The higher the demand, the higher the value. And it just keeps going up, up, up. And the bigger the EBITDA, the bigger the multiple. Now, there are some things that can lower it a little bit. They say for every 10% of Medicaid, that drops at a turn, you know, a, a, um, you know, a, a multiple. But as long as there is demand in a market, you know, why do an IPO? You don't need to. You, know, you don't need to do that risk. And you mentioned venture capital. I don't see much venture capital money in this at all. I just don't see it. Yeah, I, I, I should have said private equity. Well, you know, they're buying an asset. You know, I mentioned I, I built a DSO, but it wasn't like I started with nothing. I wasn't doing de novos, buying established practice. So you're always owning something that had a proven, uh, a proven uh, productivity. Another thing that I think is very, very interesting, like, you know, when 
a rollout, like, you know, like you have a proven concept like a Chipotle or a McDonald's or a Starbucks and you roll out hundreds of year. Um, when they're doing roll ups, every dental office they own is different. Like I, I still haven't seen anybody that came out with a cookie cutter dental office says, yeah, no. every one of our dental offices is 4,000 square feet. They're all 10 ops. Yes. They're all, there's no, there's no roll out prototype that seems to be able oh. to wherever I open it, it works. That, that, that gets back to opinion. My opinion is that um, the most viable asset in a practice is the dentist. That's why when I built my group, I never bought a practice that didn't come with a dentist who planned to stay. So that dentist was the most viable asset. That was it. I mean, I could go buy bankruptcies in Scottsdale or Aurora, Colorado if I want that. That's not what I want. So with that said, they're all going to be different, of course, because all these dentists have different strengths that you're going to focus on. Now, there are some cookie cutters, but those cookie cutters were some I mentioned earlier where I call it the one and done, where they're going to get a dentist and they're going to work their year and they're going to move on. You know who they are. Aspen, you, know? you mean Aspen? Yeah, like th that's a common one, you know, and I, and I don't want to say too much for Aspen because I don't know a lot about Aspen, to be honest, but I do know that they're – most of their practices are de novos. They they do market analysis of where there's a need, and it works. You know, but they're they're catering to a different type of, of culture and need. And I'm if they're fit and need, great. But I don't personally know of too many dentists who work for Aspen for year after year after year. I, I just haven't heard it. I think they're they get younger dentists, they work there a year or two, and they move on. I think that is their model. You know, it's not my DNA. I, I, I haven't consulted with that type of model. I, it's just not my, my, my strength. Back to, back to, um, well, the, you know, the interesting thing about Aspen versus Heartland is um, the consumer doesn't know all these offices are owned by Heartland. They all, they're all they, you know, they roll them up. They have different names. But the only way you can figure it out is their direct mail piece in very small print. You can see, you know, Heartland Dental. Well, uh, what? Why would you want to change the name? You, you got you got Doctor Fran's office that the patients love Doctor Fran and, and they just they've been going to him for fifteen years and they have a relationship with you and you understand their personal passion and they wouldn't leave you for the world. Why would you want to change that name? I mean, that's the value. The only time I see these groups, well, the only patient like that would be my mom and she knows my name. <laughs> well, the only time I see them change names is if there's a big change in the dentist. You know, maybe they do buy, maybe they do a de novo, where there's no dentist uh, re associated with that location. In that situation, they may put, you know, Happy Smiles Dental Centers, whatever they're called. They may do, they may use the company name then. Huh. Um, do you think there's a sweet spot as far as the size of the facility? I mean, is it one doctor, two doctor, three doctor, five, six, ten op? Is there uh, hours? What, what, is, what is the sweet spot among square footage, number of dentists, hours open? Again, that, and that depends entirely on the location, the type of practice. I, I will say... When you talk about number of dentists, I am I am pretty adamant that you should never put a a young dentist, or well, not young, a, a dentist who is young on experience by themselves. the 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 biggest negative impact on on a budget on income would be a doctor turnover, where you put a new dentist with very little experience all by themselves. I think that's a tragedy, and eventually they'll get there, but it takes a long time. When you put a dentist in with an experienced dentist where you have an in-house mentor, that's ideal. If you're going to hire a newer dentist, like I, I prefer if I'm going to be a newer dentist, maybe out of an AGD program, or maybe they've been a frustrated associate for a couple of years, but they have some good experience, but still, put them with a high-end mentor. You know, you don't know what you don't know, so I like... Um, and, and as far as overhead, to get to your question, uh, a two dentist practice is much more successful than, than a one. There's no question because they're sharing a lot of things. Three, you start getting more in three. It, it gets to be uh, a bit much, and it, it really depends on the demand of the area. Now, if, if you have an, an area 
where you can put in a 12 op practice and the market is, de is demand you know allows that great but i don't see that very often usually it's two or three and usually it's um it's two treatment rooms and two uh hygiene rooms for every dentist that's typically what i see now well those hygiene rooms they can flip around for emergencies and things but a dentist definitely needs a minimum of two treatment chairs and two hygiene chairs um but there but i i could ask this the other way i mean when I say what is the sweet spot, most of these people, uh, m most of these DSOs aren't interested in buying a dental office for six fifty. I mean, a lot of them have a million dollar floor. Or uh, do no, you agree with that? Or do you agree with that? You're saying they're not interested in paying six fifty? Well, yeah, yeah. If your office is one doctor too small, you know, five ops does eight hundred thousand a year. Most DSOs don't want to roll you up. I mean, a lot, a lot of them only entertain oh, deals think. that are over a million. So you could almost reverse engineer and say the sweet spot. Well, it has to do over a million a year in collection because they don't seem to really buy anything smaller than that. That is correct. That is correct. You know, it's just like a stock resistance. You know, if if. If for me to buy a practice that's only producing 800, you know, I'm going to have to see some type of uh, other reason. Like maybe the doc was doing 1.5 and he has multiple chairs and he just pushed the cruise control button and slacked back for the last couple of years where you could easily turn it around if he had to. That's kind of an exception. You know, unfortunately, a lot of these practices are not in highly desirable areas and location, just like real estate is everything. You know, they take their foot off the accelerator just a little bit. They can fall completely off the map. So, well, I, well let's, I, let's, let's talk about that. I mean, do demographics matter? I mean, I cannot tell you how many times I hear dentists say, oh, well, Utah is a class example. I mean, when I got out of school 30 years ago, Arizona didn't have any dental school. And now they have two, uh, graduating 218 new dentists a year. Utah didn't have a dental school. Now they have two. Nevada didn't have a dental school. They have one. When I talk to demographics people, um, they tell me the lowest dental income in America is in the state of Utah. Yet I always hear uh, my Mormon buddies saying, yeah, I know, I know, I don't care. But my, my old man lives up there and my wife's mom's getting up in age and I'm going back anyway. Um, do demographics matter? Completely. You know, I, I remember when I got out of dental school in 1985, you remember this, there were a lot of dentists. There were. And they're all going over the park and Scottsdale. You know, there was a lot of dentists, Omaha, Nebraska. And, and I did not want to compete. I didn't want to have a bunch of satellites. You know, I, I wanted to be busy right off. So I went to a mid sized town and I was busy from the get go. Uh, I've done market analysis on this. And what very, town was that? Uh, Southwest Iowa, called Clarinda, Iowa. And what was the population? Uh, about eight thousand people, but it, but it had a drawing area of fifty thousand with newspaper distribution. So, all things considered, I see the best dental practices in towns between fifteen and twenty-five thousand. 15,000 to 25,000. I see that again and again and again. How far of a drive would that average town of 15,000 to 25,000 be from an airport that flew Southwest Airlines? At least an hour. Minimal. It, would, would you say it's at least that? Because one of the other metrics I've noticed is by the time you're a two-hour drive yep. to fly out on Southwest Airlines, you are crushing it. You That's, are crushing it, even though you may be doing getting uh, apps and marketing and advertising. And, and I mean, you can do so many. If you're two hours away from a Southwest Airlines plane, you could almost get a D in every category and still crush it. But if you can see those planes taken off out your dental office window, oh, my God, you better be getting A's and B's yeah. in every category. I've never heard that statistic before, but I completely agree with it. You know, and even today, I still see that as a trend. Yeah, and, and I don't know what they're afraid of because, and, and I also keep telling these young kids, do you realize, I mean, you like when, I, when you and I got out of school, did you ever see the iPhone and the laptop and the iPad coming? Are you kidding me? I uh, mean, you know what, I, I, let me go back. I said pegboard. <laughs> I, I know, I mean, I still, when I got out of school, you know what the greatest invention in my childhood was? It was actually... 
um, you know, I had five sisters, so whenever the station wagon pulled up the house, since for some reason I was a boy, I'm the one who had to jump out and lift the garage door made out of all wood that weighed like eight trillion and a half pounds. And when dad installed an automatic garage door opener, I thought that was greater than landing on the moon. And what these kids don't realize around the cover, around the corner, is we're into driverless cars. So, yeah, no one wants to get up in their house and drive an hour out of town, but you're not going to be driving within five years. You're going to be sitting there in a box, just like you're sitting here at home in your, in your lazy boy, watching your big screen or sitting at a desk on your PC. You'll just go get in a box, put in your coordinates, and then all of a sudden it'll be ding, we're here. So the, these, these punishing commutes are almost at extinction level events. Uh, within five, it'll start, and with ten, uh, it could be critical mass. We are um, closer to that than you think. Yeah, yeah, and and it's so crazy because uh, we're out here in Ground Zero with Google's driverless cars, and we had one person killed, and um, one person killed, and you thought the sky was falling. Yet they didn't, know, they, they didn't talk know. about thirty-five thousand Americans will be killed this year by humans driving cars. And on the day the one person got killed by the driverless car, a hundred Americans were killed by humans driving a car. Times ten were picked up by an ambulance. So, um, so demographics do matter. You like fifteen thousand to twenty-five thousand. Uh, so do I. Two hours from an airport, huge. Let's go back to PPOs. Um, there's uh, lots of consultants out there that, that advertise they do PPO consulting. Are these um, DSOs, are they successful with negotiating PPO prices? Yes, <laughs> they are. They are. But it, it, it really depends on the volume. You know, you're talking about with insurance, PPO right. insurance. Yeah, they, they are. But again, it depends on the volume. And you don't ask, you don't receive. I remember, oh gosh, it's been... Over 10 years ago, my first experience in this, I was um, talking to a CEO of a, of a uh, Midwest DSO, been around a long time, she'd been CEO for 30 years, and she was talking about when they negotiated with Delta Dental. That was back when Delta Premier actually was pretty good, and I could not believe the results that they were getting. You, know, you don't ask, you don't receive. So, you know, they've gotten more cu- accustomed to uh, the negotiations, I believe they have a chart. And, you know, if you have a certain amount of volume, they'll allow more. But again, if you don't ask, they won't go there. So you have to you have to go down the road and negotiate. I mean, you can do it with lab bills. You can do it with insurance. I mean, I worked with a fantastic uh, insurance group this last year. And, you know, the, the big insurance groups, like you think liability, like CNA and Medical Protective, they, are, they have their protector plan or the package and and uh, we believe that could be beat and we did it we worked with Cincinnati who was our liability carrier we packaged in some other um, some other um, insurance that, that are needs you know workman's comp and property and casualty and we killed it killed it so you know there's a lot of room for you know what is major growth you start paying attention to something it will change you know, so whether it's up, down, sideways, you know, you, but you have to have, uh, you have to measure intentionally. You have to have project leaders. You have to be accountability at all levels and you have to visit it, you know, enough to make a difference and you have to have transparency. Anybody has an impact on what you're trying to do has to understand how to be measured. It's pretty, pretty, pretty simple, but you just get to make an effort. Um, Another question uh, they always wonder about DSOs, you know, people like Pat Bauer, I mean, just legendary, um, you know, they, they know their numbers like nobody else. Um, Steve Thorne knows his numbers. I mean, Steve Thorne has full-time programmers just programming. Well, they're, they're brilliant guys, too. Yeah. But are you, do you, th- their question is this, are you seeing return on investments in chair-side milling upgrade? Is there technology where you say? Oh, yes. Okay, what, what, which ones and why? Yes. Well, I remember when I first got involved with my group doing CERAC, and I was looking at CERAC and D4D. I love competition. Competition is great. You know, I, I went through training on both E4D, D4D, and CERAC, and, and you know, the more you have, the, 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 the more um, economically you can be. For example, 
let's say you have 25 practices that have imaging units. You could have a central uh, milling center. You know, I, I've helped groups do that. Instead of having a milling center in each office, they have one office with one or two or three MCXLs, you know, the milling units for CEREC, and they have somebody there who's brilliant at design, and they just send the image to them, and they overnight the crown to them, or you know, now they may not get, they may not be getting it same day in that situation unless they're down the street, which is one of the advantages of milling a crown, get it the same day. But gosh, it's a good step. I've seen groups that are their goal is to maybe have a million center in every office, and their budget is so much, and it's cheaper to buy three imaging units than one image unit and one million center, but they step in that direction. But as you develop the skills, you, your overhead definitely goes down. You know, the, these, these docs that are really, really good at CERC or D4D, they start thinking in terms of limiting factors, which I applaud. I think a dentist should always think of limiting factors. Uh, his or her time should be the limiting factor. They start thinking in terms of getting it in the million chamber. The million chamber is going to be a limiting factor. And these are the docs that have the technology all inside their office. So they, the image just crown, boom, they get an image center. I remember working with offices that couldn't afford MCXL. But these compact units, this, they're, they're, the precursors of the MCXL for Cerex, they're paperweights, they're dime a dozen. So they buy two or three of those, and they get two or three different routers. And they would send it to one, then they'd send the next crown to the next one, the next, you know, yeah, they're slower, but they're multitasking with their milling, and it made sense. It made sense. So, I mean, technology, I mean, I think of the carries detection systems. I mean, there's no way I'd practice a day without some type of good quality carries detection system. It, 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 it makes me cringe to think about all the, the, uh, the carries that I missed because I used an Explorer that was a quarter mile wide trying to put it in a, in a crack that was an eighth mile wide. It just didn't fit. I'm looking at, looking at it my eyes. I'm looking at this two-dimensional x-ray and blowing the snot off the goobers back there on number 15. And well, you, you've, you've entered into these, and whoa, there's a huge room there. At least with these systems, you know what you're getting into. You know, uh, do I need to anesthetize? And I grab my, I used to use air abrasion or bio laser or whatever laser. Can I grab that instead of, getting the septicane out and my slow speed round, you know, and that's efficiency. When you have knowledge from, from technology, you can be very efficient. Which carries detection system do you recommend the most? Well, thank you for asking that. I had the blessing of getting into the research lab at University of Texas where they had them all there. And I'll probably, I'm sure Gordon Christian makes enemies when he gives recommendations. The best one by far, is Canary. There's no question Canary is the best, for a lot of reasons, but the reason technology. Now, the downside to, to Canary, and the reason I say Canary is the best, because it works different than any of the rest of them. It triangulates, it can find cavities, and approximately it can find cavities underneath amalgams, composites, and it's accurate. They all have their own pros and cons. The cons to Canary is the price point. It needs to come down, and it's still a little bit cumbersome. You know, a lot of wires and things, hard to move it from room to room. It's gotten better, way better, way better. But, uh, you know, I had died in it. That's, I had one in each room. I mean, I had one in all my rooms. And downside to Dignadent is, you know, the, the, the assistance breaks the tips. So you don't know how to calibrate them. You know, so there's some problems with that. Spectra is outstanding. Christian loves Spectra. At least Spectra will give you a number. And number is not, you know, all subjective, where SoPro gives just colors. You have to say, well, you know, it, it may be great for teaching mom something, but it's not subjective. It doesn't have a number that you compare it to from last time. But, it's, you know, there, there's several out there. What I, what I tell docs is get one, learn how to use it, embrace it. Just like a camera or videos or anything else. I mean, one of my lectures I give is called Gadgets That Gather Dust. I talk Talk about ellip everybody's ellipticals and gym memberships. Next thing you know, they're hanging laundries on the treadmill. You know, you dentists love gadgets. And if you're going to have these gadgets, embrace them, use them. I mean, most dental software, dentists only know how to use 15 to 20% of it. That's all they use. You know, if they actually learn how to use what they have, they'll be better. You know, I wish you'd put some of your lectures on Dental Town. Uh, we have uh, 400 and some courses. The views are coming. They're all an hour long. They're ADA approved, HD approved. They're coming up on a million views. Millennials love 
They'd rather come home after work and uh, open up this course on their iPhone, throw it up on their big screen Apple TV for one hour, then block off Friday and drive all the way down to some brick building convention center and well, spend their whole Friday. Well, you, you know what I'm going to say about dental town. You, you filled a need. I mean, I think back, gosh, I don't want to start late 80s, early 90s. You know, there, nothing like dental town existed. Where do you go to get a forum of enough dentists to have a chi square? It made sense and get opinions on things. I mean, where do you go to learn how to dump Delta Dental? Or where do you go to learn about the best um, lighting system or or implant system? Or I mean, it, you filled a great need at a, at a good time. You know. Yeah, we were. Uh, uh, we came out in ninety uh, uh, St. Patrick's Day. 99 and uh um the um facebook was until 2006 um i want to you said something about you know if you have 25 practices and everybody scans you can have one milling but you can't get a same day there's another thing i've noticed massively across many industries and that is um when i go into a town and let, let's say it's a hundred thousand and there's some dental office there on the south side and he says you know i i need to i have so much more efficiencies if I open up one on the north, east, and west, and then if I had four offices, I could afford to have a layer management where I could have a professional Pat Bauer um, a marketing person, uh, you know, an HR person, accounting or whatever. Those are crushing it, and I've seen it so much. You know, my dad, um, you know, I grew up in the Sonic Drive-In franchise. Uh, Dan and Beverly Carney were at the same church. They founded Pizza Hut, and and. Now I am friends with a guy who owns eight Waffle Houses and some Subways. But you take two guys that own eight Waffle Houses, and one guy owns eight Waffle Houses in Mesa, and the other guy owns eight, eight Waffle Houses spread out over four states. The guys who concentrate, my, you know, uh, uh, Dan Carney used to say a, a thousand times, said, I'd rather, I'd rather be in a town of, of 15,000 with one highway going through it and this franchisee zone, one Pizza Hut at one end of town on that highway and one Pizza Hut, you know, keep it close together. I see, you see it in dental laboratories. I remember, you know, like, yes, Glidewell has 5% of the entire market. They do one out of every 20 crowns, but it's spread over three and a half square right. million miles. Whereas you go up to like where Lord's is in uh, Wisconsin and it's like, they have half the dentists in Wisconsin are their clients. I'm Green Dental in Arkansas. I mean, so here's a lab that says, you know what? There's enough business in Arkansas. We don't need to worry about Alabama and Mississippi and Georgia and Tennessee. Let's just focus on our state. And I, I tell people that do group, stay close. I mean, you know, there's, there's uh, look at Patterson, Pete Frouchette, when he started Patterson. He yep. said, there's so much money in America. I said, why, why should I go to Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom? And uh, he, he uh, while well, Stan Bergman and Henry Schein went to, I think, 55 different countries, Pete, it almost killed him to just add Canada. And everybody kept saying, uh, Pete, if you just raise the North American border 100 miles, you'd get 90% of all the Canadian people. Um, so... I, I think keeping it local um, keeps it focused. I want to – go ahead. No, there's two points. Well, what, one was a question you asked earlier I really never addressed. One point is you have to be able to serve what you have. And a common way to do it is what I call hub and spokes. So maybe you set up a main practice and you set up ancillaries around it. And the advantages of clustering a practice geographically – it allows management to have touches with those practice. And a common way, uh, regional coordinators, field coordinators, uh, usually these are a front office manager who has tremendous skills. I mean, I, I look at Family First, for example, one of my clients. They, they, that's the way they do it. And these are high-end regional coordinators, great skills. And they touch each practice in person once a week. And that's important. That's important. And one thing I learned from, I think Midwest Dental made a couple statements. Um, great, they're great management. They're great guys, great and gals. And they said one of the most important things that they learned was, and I, I agree with this, you have to work through, if you have a DSO, work through the dentist. I'm all about training doctors to lead, training doctors to be the leaders. Don't just go in the office and work with the office manager because that reduces the doctor to an employment employee mentality and that 
enhance a doctor turnover. You know, a little Hawthorne effect, you know, valuing, appreciating your doctors. I was here, I heard Bruce Christopher lecturing the other day. He's one of the top, uh, uh, of, of all the, um, uh, what do they call, uh, evaluations you fill out for speakers, the ADA, Bruce Christopher is one of the top speaker rated speakers. Bruce Crispin? Bruce Christopher, if, if you look at all the evaluations for all the speakers of the ADA, he was number one about four years ago. I don't know what today. I, I knew that because the head of programs is a friend of mine. But anyway, he's, he lectures about appreciation. When you appreciate people, when people leave jobs because of lack of appreciation, or lack of value, the old Hawthorne effect. There's a great study by McGregor. You're a smart guy. You got to read. It's a great study. Well, you, you said Hawthorne effect twice, so explain that one to the homies uh, about that. That was a great study by Westinghouse, wasn't it? I'm not sure, to be honest. Yeah. I know what it is, and I know it's about make you you appreciate it. It's, remember the old book by Ken Blanchard, 1980, The One Minute Manager? Pretty simple philosophy, you know. You catch people doing something right. You well, I, I just want to say one thing on the Hawthorne effect, because you mentioned twice. It was in Westinghouse, and what they, they noticed is that um, they, um, they increased the light, and the productivity went up really, really high. So then they thought, okay, the scientists thought, well, let's decrease the light, and see in another factory as the control. So, you know, they had multiple factories, so they went to another one and decreased the light, and it went up. They're like, well, wait a minute. We increased the light, productivity went up. We decreased the light. Long story short, what happened is when the employees realized that the management gave a shit and, were, exactly and were caring about them and were exactly. concerned about them and, and that they were the center of attention, they were happier and worked harder. They just want to know that someone cared. It's pretty simple. That's more, you know, the, the McGregor studies was about what's more important, value or skill. And the, and the answer is really both. But when you value, when somebody feels valued, it's like the parent-child. When, when, when your kid feels so valued and so appreciated, it encourages their behavior and they want to please you. And so anyway, these, these, these DSOs were sitting in their regional coordinators and they weren't working with the doctor. They were working with the front office. And that, that's a huge mistake. The other question you asked earlier had to do with these uh, bankruptcies of offices. These docs that go out, they get one, they get two, and then three, they go bankrupt. I get a call once a week from somebody who has the money and they have the desire to build a DSO. Everybody wants to build a DSO. They're willing to build a de novo. And usually it's a dentist who's doing great. They're killing it at their practice. They're a high-end dental town doc. They are killing it. And like you said, if it's the guy that's the dentist, they got the wife at home, they've raised their standard of living. You know, and they're pulling down a lot of money every month. They've raised their standard of living to, to meet that income. Here's the problem. And I tell these docs, until you're willing to give up that money tree and devote full time to your DSO, which means stop practicing dentistry. You're going to be the full-time management. You're going to be mentoring the doctors. You're going to be leading the charge. You can't do it. You cannot make two of you. You can't work full-time and build a DSO. So then there's the guys that aren't dentists that want to build the DSO. And the number one limiting factor I see is not having the right management in place. And that, that creates bankruptcies. You know, that, that's, there's, there's a big shortage. I mean, there are humans are so hypocritical. I get, if, oh my God, I just get nauseous when I hear some dentists saying, look at the national deficit. They need to start cutting entitlements. They need to start cutting entitlements. I'm like, really? Well, your wife's sitting right over there. Why don't you go tell her that you're going to cut her entitlements in half? And it's <laughs> like, oh, oh, so you want the president to tell 325 million people to cut their entitlements, but you can't tell Muffy, really? And, uh. <laughs> So um, I, want, I want to ask another thing. I just want to go back to something you said earlier. I want you to expand upon it because that might have confused some of the kids. You said that when you're looking at EBITDA multiples, yes. that obviously um, as you start getting bigger and bigger numbers, like from one million a year in sales to two to three to four to five, the multiples can get higher and get as high as five. But if they take Medicaid or Medicare, it starts knocking them down. So, right. what, so what are your thoughts? Why is that? And expound upon what you said. What are your thoughts on Medicaid and Medicare? All right, there's several things here. These are almost moving targets, and I see the trends. I, as high as mobile five? No, that's as low as five. You know, uh, five years ago, if you had 10 million EBITDA and 15 practices, you're going to get a multiple of five. Today, 
you're going to multiply 12. It's gone way up. But uh, when the, um, the media got hold of one of the groups, particularly one in Texas that was in the news, and uh, they, the attorney general went after him, accused him of billing for services they hadn't done. And about the same time, there is a, a uh, investment banker, a investment bank on the East Coast, did a very large summit. It was one of the early summits. Now everybody's doing summits. And it was one of the early summits that was sponsored by an investment bank. And they had a, a speaker there that stood up and made everybody think that Medicaid was the boogeyman. And all private equity was running from Medicaid because there was a lot of unknowns, a lot of unknowns. Illinois and Texas, they're, they're the ones that there's attorney generals coming down hard on everybody and is making the, the news and there's a lot of unknowns. And this is about, this was at its worst about five years ago, four and a half years ago. And now the dust has settled. I'd rather go to a state like Texas that's, They've, they've been there, done that. At least you know you know where they stand. And so I've, I, there was a point in my career where I was not much of a Medicaid expert. Since then, I've consulted with some Medicaid groups that are 80% plus Medicaid. And I will say that if your practice, your DSO, does not have an excess of 65% Medicaid, of everything you do, at your service mix, if it doesn't have an excess of 65% Medicaid, you're going to struggle to, um, to have great profits. You really need to position your group to specialize in Medicaid to do well at it. The groups that have 90% plus Medicaid do pretty darn good. And the ones that focus on pedo do even better. You know, it's, it's political suicide to cut children's benefits. So those are pretty secure. You know, I hate putting all my eggs in one basket, but these trends change. What I said earlier, so let's say we have a multiple of 10. Let's say we have a group, you know, you gotta have enough numbers, you have to have trends. Let's say we have a DSL that's been around for 10 years and they have 30 practices and they have a solid business plan. They have a, a team in place that's been established for a long time, you know, good history. And their EBITDA is ten million, and um, but their um, Medicaid is thirty percent. Well, where their multiple was ten, it may be seven. For every for every ten uh, percent of Medicaid, it reduces it what we call one term, one multiple. That's the current trends today. It could be different a year or two from now. It's definitely different than it was a couple of years ago. So when you were talking about that Texas chain, you were talking about Cool Smiles, right? Cool Smiles Dental Centers? Yep. This is Dentistry Uncensored. Hey, you're down there in Texas. You're down there in Cur Kerrville, Texas, where it's the headquarters of, I assume, Kerr Dental? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's not. No, I know. That's Orange County. Um, out of San Antonio. But are, are you, do you know the people behind Dentist the Menace? No. That blog site? that Because that, that's down there by you. That's Dentist the Menace. It, it's a, they, um, it's kind of a, the pseudonym. Uh, someone's penning it. I have ideas of who it is. I've been told it's one person. I thought maybe you know uh, no. the person doing that. All I want to say to my homies is this. Um, physicians, dentists, and lawyers, they're never humble people. They're always kind of arrogant. And okay. it's one thing when your cousin Eddie owes you money, uh, but it's very different uh, when, I mean, uh, when you owe your cousin Eddie money versus the IRS. Uh, well, you, you think all these TV shows saw as a kid always had a jury. Well, when you go to the IRS court, there's no jury. It's you and the IRS court. You know, there's no games. Same thing, you know, Delta, Dental, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, all these private American companies, I don't care if they're for profit or non-profit or whatever, that's a civil deal, disagreement, whatever. But man, when you start dealing with Medicaid, it's just a state level and Medicare is a national level. And I know it's confusing to uh, mm -hmm. our international viewers because they would just think America had like just one government entitled, but it's got 50 different states where Medicaid's slightly different in every state. 
But my gosh, when dentist Medicaid, if they find a fly on your arm, they are going to hit it with a sledgehammer. And uh, so, you know, like I say, it's one thing if you owe your brother money. It's another if you owe the IRS. Well, here's something one, else. You know, these guys are brutal. They are. And when the attorney general's office, when they hire this young lawyer just out of, out of law school and they say, go check into this ABC dental group, they don't make a name for themselves coming back and say, everything's great. They're, they're going for it. And that's, that's how they make a name for themselves, by finding something wrong. And, you know, so let's so, say so, – So on that point, I mean, when you never talk about religion, sex, politics, or violence, but you're absolutely right. I mean, the state attorney generals, uh, their average conviction rate on drug crimes is north of 95%. I mean, and, and, and right now, um, you know, you can say all these things political, but how many convictions – has Mueller already got all around Donald Trump? What is what has he got? Fifteen. Yeah. I mean, you can't. I mean, this is going to be a war. This is going to be crazy. I think. Do you think we're at the dawn of some crazy stuff out of Washington? You know, I'm just glad I'm not in politics. <laughs> you know, you just you, you you have to just insulate yourself. I think if I was Trump, I would say, just tell me what I need to know. Don't tell me what everybody else thinks of me. You know, and um, I, I applaud Trump for not being a politician. <laughs> I do. I, I mean, he's he's never been a politician. He just kind of runs businesses when the country is a business, and I he kind of says it like he is. Some things he probably shouldn't say, but he does anyway. That's just the way he is. And I well, think the politicians don't like it. <laughs> they don't like it because I thought the way they behave in the. Past. You know, well, well, just one one final summary on this to the kids, and that is, uh, again, Medicaid is not the same as Blue Cross and Blue Shield and Connecticut General and Doe. That that's government. The IRS is not the same as a loan that that you defaulted on with Chase National Bank. I mean, the difference between Chase and the IRS or Medicaid and Delta is like two different countries, and one. Um, will solve all their problems with a sledgehammer, and the other one uh, will be, you know, you guys will, lawyers will talk, it'll be amenable. Final question. You promised me an hour of your life, and we're at hour seven. Um, one last question. The thing that really bothers dentists so much is they say, going back to insurance, they say, my hygienist, I have to pay in my market $40 an hour, yet Delta's only given me $55 for a cleaning and my overhead's two-thirds. I mean, the American Dental Association says the average overhead in America is 65%. Rant on hygiene. What are your thoughts on hygiene? Is it, is it just, is it, could it, can it be profitable? Is it just a lost leader so the dentist isn't doing profi so they can be doing root canals and crowns? What are your thoughts on the hygiene department? I'm very passionate about hygiene. It can be very profitable. When I do consulting, it's one of the first areas I look at. I do an overall service mix. I, and I, I look at Canberra. I look, then I dig into the perio. I, I look at everything that's coded perio, including profs, and I look at just that. If a practice is is truly upholding the perio standard of care, including Canberra, sixty percent of their perio income. And and again, I'm talking about just perio plus profs. That includes and that also includes uh, adult fluoride because I'm t or any fluoride. So any fluoride, any Prio code plus profis is 100%. Of the total billing, 60% of their billing should be all the Prio procedures except profis. Profis should be 40%. If they're doing that, they're spot on according to the current standard of care as established in, gosh, 2008. Remember Charlie Cobb in UMKC? He was, yeah, he was our histology teacher. He was one of the three that did the research, the ADA, the Perio, and the American Periodontology. Ex ex they accepted this as the current standard of care. The standard of care before that was in 2004, and the only change had to do with four millimeter pockets so when you have greater than 10% bone loss. But anyway, you know, so this is an area that most practices don't uphold correctly. So with that said, you can increase Perio 
by just practicing the standard care. You know, when you go into an office and you're not saying you need to whiten teeth or do more veneer or something like that, you're saying uh, the opposite of standard, you know, if you're not doing standard of care, you're doing something called malpractice. So let's like do the standard of care. So that's easier to uh, get people to embrace. Now, with that said, you, how do you incentivize hygienists? I'm a, I'm a huge believer in incentive style pay. I, I like to, so you got this per hour and you, and you have some incentive style pay. And I like to do both, you know, whichever is highest. And it's easier to get people to buy into practicing the way they're supposed to practice. You know, evaluating the risk of Canberra or, you know, it's just a lot easier for them to embrace it. I believe it, a, a properly designed incentive program should more than pay for itself and should incentivize people's behavior. But it, it can be very profitable and it can help you practice correctly and the patient can benefit from it also. And I'm not going to turn over any dead stones, but do you remember what Charles Cobb, most controversial paper he ever did ever? When he gave his opinion, I'm not even going to say what it is. When he gave his opinion on dental lasers, oh my gosh. Uh, he, in, this. in fact, I wanted him to come on my show. I talked to him. I wanted him to come on my show and talk about what he thought about dental lasers. And he goes, yeah. I, he says, I'm sure you do for dentistry. And <laughs> he goes, I'm not going to do it. He said, he, he said he's too tired. But, um, hey, man, that was an hour 10. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for all that you do for dentistry. I, I, do you think you'll ever make create us a, uh, our courses online or an hour long? I'd love to have an hour long online C course from you that, you're so informative. Uh, it raises our credibility. Uh, I, you know, it just uh, if you ever if you ever if you ever bored someday and have nothing to do, uh, okay. build us yeah. an online CE course. And um, seriously, um, and thanks for all that you do for the UMKC alumni meetings. And uh, and uh, and by the way, three your third generation. Do you think there'll be a fourth generation dentist in the Mosier family? Was- there's a good possibility. Good possibility. Good possibility. Well, Howard, next time you're in the San Antonio area, give me a call. All right, Love buddy. Taking- actually, actually, I can't believe you just said that. My oldest granddaughter, Taylor Marie, her daddy, my oldest son, is moving. Uh, he's. It's between San Antonio. It's. He told me it's halfway between San Antonio and Refugio, because he told me just dental offices he'd been hunting at. Um, San Antonio. What? San Antonio and Refugio. Ref- it's spelled refugio, but um, who's who's the guy that we? I don't know. So we went pig hunting on um, Tim, Rainey. Tim Rainey. Tim Rainey's down in Refugio, Texas, and okay. so so he knows every city by dad's dentist friend that he's been to <laughs> or hunted at or whatever. Uh, but anyway, they're they're moving there. So well, he I'll won't be, move. he won't leave. I'll tell you that. Oh yeah, but so I'll be flying down there all the time to see my little granddaughter. So next time I'm flying through, I'll let you know. Give me a shout. All right, buddy. Have a rocking hot day. Hey, thanks, Howard.